according to Xinhua News Agency, on October 13, the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation signed a memorandum of cooperation with Jepin Fang Semiconductor, Shanghai, Limited in Hong Kong. Both parties announced the establishment of a global research and development center in Hong Kong Science Park, primarily focused on third-generation semiconductors. They also plan to invest in Hong Kong's first significant semiconductor wafer fab. When you think of Hong Kong, the first impressions that most people conjure are of a financial center, a shopper's paradise, and an international metropolis. But did Hong Kong really have its own semiconductor industry in the past? How did Hong Kong gradually lose this industry? In fact, those who ask this question may not be well-versed in the history of Hong Kong's semiconductor industry. Today, I'm going to take you on a journey to revisit the rollercoaster history of Hong Kong's semiconductor industry. By the end of this video, I believe we will have answers to the questions above. So, let's get started now. Regarding more practical questions, what's the plan behind establishing a wafer fab in the land-starved city of Hong Kong? Currently, research and development in third-generation semiconductors is in its early stages worldwide. What are the chances of Hong Kong succeeding in developing third-generation semiconductors? Can Hong Kong achieve its aspirations in the semiconductor industry with the support of the mainland's vast market? I'll share my views in the next video. Once known as the four Asian tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, they all witness the transfer of the U.S. semiconductor industry almost simultaneously. Massive inflows of capital and technology turned these places into new havens for the semiconductor industry. Apart from foreign investments, local semiconductor companies sprouted up like mushrooms. Companies like TSMC, Samsung, Chartered. These names, which are familiar to us today, might have once been nothing more than a single factory building, a few offices, and a handful of employees. Today, we often praise the semiconductor miracles achieved by the first three but we tend to overlook the last of the four Asian tigers, Hong Kong, which was once on par with Singapore. However, there are now very few well-known semiconductor companies in Hong Kong, and semiconductor giants have not chosen to build wafer fabs here. It's as if Hong Kong never had any dealings with the semiconductor industry. In reality, Hong Kong was once the earliest in Asia to possess semiconductor factories. In the late 1950s, Jack Kilby of Texas Instruments and Robert Noyce of Fairchild Semiconductor successively invented and introduced integrated circuit technology. Besides the orders from the US aerospace and military sectors, another driving force behind the development of integrated circuits from companies like Texas Instruments and Fairchild, was the rise of Japan. By the late 1950s, Japanese manufacturers invested heavily to acquire the production technology for low-quality transistors aimed at consumers. By 1959, the annual production of Japanese transistors exceeded that of American companies, with about 55% of the transistors produced for radios and over 70% for export. Squeezed American semiconductor companies began looking for new avenues. In the end, Fairchild Semiconductor turned its gaze towards East Asia, and Hong Kong, being the center for exporting consumer electronics products to the United States at that time, was an attractive option. Not only did Hong Kong have abundant labor resources and low wages, but it also offered many tax incentives. Labor-intensive industries like clothing manufacturing, plastics, electronics, and the toy sector had already migrated to Hong Kong from Europe and the United States, making it a natural choice for Robert Noyce. Through on-site investigations to assess the possibility of establishing a factory in Hong Kong, Noyce found that the hourly wage for Hong Kong workers was approximately 25 cents which was one-tenth of the hourly wage in the United States. Local workers were more willing to take on demanding work compared to their American counterparts. It could be said that you couldn't find more reliable workers than Chinese female laborers. In 1962, Fairchild Semiconductor leased a rubber shoe factory on Hennessy Road in Hong Kong and registered a company. Here, they built their first semiconductor factory outside the United States, marking the beginning of the semiconductor industry in Hong Kong. Of course, Hong Kong, with its selling point of cheap and abundant labor, wasn't equipped to handle complex front-end processes. After the Hong Kong factory officially started production in 1963, the primary production process involved Fairchild manufacturing wafers in the United States, shipping them to Hong Kong for packaging and testing. A portion of the chips were eventually sent back to the United States, while the rest were directly sold in Asia. Hong Kong's manufacturing advantage at the time was built on the foundation of free trade and low-cost labor. 
After achieving success in Hong Kong, Fairchild didn't put all its eggs in one basket. The reason was simple, other Asian countries and regions offered government subsidies, more abundant land resources, and lower wages that Hong Kong did not have. At that time, hourly wages for workers in Taiwan were as low as 19 cents, while Malaysia was 15 cents, Singapore 11 cents, and South Korea as low as 10 cents. The packaging and testing processes didn't require highly specialized skills, so Fairchild Semiconductor, along with later companies like Intel and AMD, set up factories in Singapore, Malaysia's Penang, Taiwan, and South Korea. The semiconductor industry has stringent requirements for factory specifications, ideally favoring spacious single-floor areas to avoid vibrations caused by high-rise factories, which can affect machine precision. However, in Hong Kong, the high cost of land made building single-floor factories an unaffordable luxury. When South Korea and Taiwan were constructing their first wafer fabs, female workers in Hong Kong were toiling in cramped and dimly lit high-rise buildings, performing mechanical and repetitive tasks. The emergence of large-scale integration, LSI, and very large-scale integration, VLSI, made it even harder for the small workshops within Hong Kong's buildings to keep pace with the new technological advancements. However, during the initial stages of the industry's development, these issues weren't as prominent. In 1975, the total value of electronic product exports in Hong Kong was 2.757 billion Hong Kong dollars. By 1978, it had more than doubled, reaching 6.464 billion Hong Kong dollars. In 1981, it had again grown by roughly double the amount from 1978. This was the peak of Hong Kong's manufacturing industry, and the thriving city had become the focal point in East Asia for many. During the 1970s and 1980s, Hong Kong was still under British rule, and the developmental mindset of the United Kingdom inevitably influenced Hong Kong. In the 1980s, Hong Kong was following a self-devised, positive non-interventionism, model that believed in market reliance and letting the market handle problems to the greatest extent possible. While this model seemed to create an economic miracle in Hong Kong, it almost equated to relinquishing the semiconductor industry. In the 1980s, the governments of Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore were heavily investing resources into semiconductors and integrated circuits. They actively attracted foreign investment and technology while nurturing local manufacturers. However, Hong Kong, during the heyday of positive non-interventionism, usually only engaged in supporting roles and did not provide resource allocation, allowing companies to develop freely. So, when Samsung's Lee Kuan He raised the Dram Crown and Morris Chan courted orders for TSMC, Hong Kong's contribution to the global semiconductor industry diminished day by day within the containers at Victoria Harbor. Nevertheless, in the 1990s, Hong Kong's semiconductor industry showed one last glimmer of hope. Motorola established a presence in Hong Kong in the 1980s and set up a research and development center. This empowered Hong Kong with the capability to independently design and produce chips. The Dragon Ball chip, designed in 1995, was developed by Motorola's subsidiary in Hong Kong, VLSI Technology. The chip was designed and produced in Hong Kong, and VLSI Technology was the largest chip company in Hong Kong at the time. It established three semiconductor testing and packaging factories in Hong Kong, with the Silicon Harbor Center in Tai Po being the second largest chip testing center in all of Asia by the late 1990s. So, where did VLSI Technology ultimately go? In 2002, after over 30 years of operation in Hong Kong, VLSI Technology announced the relocation of most of its production lines to Tianjin, China, due to high rental and labor costs in Hong Kong. It can be said that, after entering the 21st century, the semiconductor industry in Hong Kong essentially met its demise. As the manufacturing industry gradually disappeared, even the Hong Kong government, which adhered to positive non-interventionism, did not remain idle when it came to rescuing the industry. In 1998, then-Chief Executive Tung Chiwa, in his policy address, first proposed that Hong Kong should become a global leader in the development and application of information technology, particularly in e-commerce and software development. Lee Koshing's son, Richard Lee, who graduated from Stanford University, responded to this call. He believed that the area near the University of Hong Kong in Pokfulam was best suited to replicate the successful experience of Silicon Valley in the United States. Hence, he proposed the creation of a Hong Kong Silicon Valley, known as the Cyberport Project. In March 1998, the Hong Kong government unveiled this plan, and eight internationally renowned companies, 
including HP, IBM, Oracle, and Yahoo, signed letters of intent to consider setting up operations. A month later, the number of interested companies increased to 34, including mobile giants like Ericsson and Nokia, who expressed significant interest in the Cyberport project. The Hong Kong government allocated land to Richard Lee's Pacific Century Cyberworks, PCCW, through a land grant. People hoped that Hong Kong could revive its manufacturing industry through this plan. However, once PCCW obtained the land, they focused on real estate development instead. As a result, the Cyberport project turned into another lucrative real estate venture. Around the same time that the Cyberport plan was introduced, the Silicon Harbor plan was also proposed. In July 1999, Victor Hui, chairman of Da Sing Banking Group, led an effort to establish six wafer fabs in Hong Kong. They hoped to cooperate with semiconductor engineer Zhong Rujing from Taiwan, and transplant Taiwan Science Park development experience to Hong Kong. At that time, Da Sing Banking Group requested the Hong Kong government to allocate 200 to 250 hectares of land at favorable tax rates and prices to build wafer fabs and their supporting facilities. However, Hong Kong media kept questioning this plan as land speculation. In response, Da Sing Banking Group modified its proposal to lease 20 to 30 hectares of land, with flexibility in choosing the location. Nevertheless, they could not obtain the necessary approvals from the Hong Kong authorities, and the Silicon Harbor plan ultimately fell through. While they couldn't garner support for building wafer fabs, the green light was given for real estate development. This ironic reality starkly presented itself to the semiconductor industry in Hong Kong. Silicon Harbor eventually left Hong Kong and chose another eastern pearl, Shanghai. It was later renamed SMIC, Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation. For years later, SMIC returned to Hong Kong, but this time it was listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The moment the gavel struck marked not just a financial milestone but perhaps a mourning for the once thriving semiconductor industry. Over two decades after the decline of the semiconductor industry, academia in Hong Kong has formed a consensus that attributes it to the society's focus on short-term gains and immediate economic benefits. The pursuit of quick success and profit at the expense of long-term planning has left Hong Kong lacking in technological appreciation. From the government to the business sector, and even among university students, there is a lack of recognition of the value of technology. Many don't believe that Hong Kong can nurture its technology industry and reap substantial economic rewards from it. Do you agree with this viewpoint? Please share your opinions in the comments. In the next episode, I will continue to discuss the prospects of the semiconductor industry in Hong Kong. See you next time.